Good evening. So, this in my hand is a piece of fabric. If I were asked to describe it, I would say it's a couple yards of material, very lightweight, very pretty sky blue color. Other than that, it's not very remarkable or extraordinary. This piece of fabric is called the hijab. It is worn by many different women around the world. And it looks like it, there's a delay. Um, it's worn by many different women around the world, many Muslim women around the world. And it is inarguably one of the most powerful articles of clothing um, that exists. It elicits a wide range of emotions, both positive and negative, and it's debated time and again by both women who do and don't wear it and the men who like to dictate to women how to dress. It has been banned in some public spaces and public universities in some countries. And for better or for worse, it is an essential part of my American Muslim identity. Uh, one of the best parts about it is I never have to worry about a bad hair day. <laughs> to the communities that I advocate for, I am a social justice activist. My name is Zainab. And to the barista at the Starbucks down the street, I'm Zena. Like the social war the warrior justice princess, I reassure myself. And to my fifth grade elementary school teacher, I am simply the letter Z. My disyllabic, foreign sounding name is simply too difficult to pronounce. In Arabic, my name means father's pride or father's jewel. And to many Americans who've never met a Muslim before, my name means oppressed because they imagine the only way a woman would ever dress the way that I do, especially one who's been born, raised, and educated in the United States, is if she's forced. But the reality is I chose to wear the headscarf when I was 19 years old, and I became the first woman in my family to do so. And I've never regretted the decision. I am from Baltimore. Um, I often get asked, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Baltimore. And people say, but no, where are you really from? And I say, I'm from Baltimore. And they get this confused look on their face, as if somebody who looks like me who dresses like me couldn't possibly be from this diverse city. But I promise you, I am from Baltimore. I, that means I bleed purple. I am a huge diehard fan of the Baltimore Ravens um, and any team that defeats the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> and um, my husband is from New Jersey. Um, we've been married six beautiful years. And he's taught me a lot about life. For example, in every marriage, there are two people. One person is always right, and the other one is a husband. <laughs> a lot of people ask me, how does your husband let you do the work that you do? Activism is not an easy job. And I tell them, to my mind, I'm thinking, they probably think Muslim men oppress Muslim women. They tell them what to do, what to go, where to go, what to do, how to act. Um, and we actually enjoy an equal opportunity marriage. Sometimes that's not so great when you have to pay the dinner bill. I'm not quite sure with the clicker, it's not working. So um, even though I am a diehard NFL fan, um, this season I am on an NFL hiatus. Unlike the President of the United States, I believe that sometimes standing for justice requires taking a knee. And that's not always a popular position to take but sometimes we have to stand on principle. I am the proud daughter of immigrants. Back when Lady Liberty's torch still burned bright and before the days of the Muslim ban or the expanded travel ban, um, when our nation still welcomed immigrants, my parents had the opportunity to come to the United States and settle and build a better life for themselves and their children. 
Collectively, they've been working for almost five decades to help serve our nation's veterans and their loved ones. I grew up in a male-dominated Punjabi household, so I have three brothers, I'm the only girl. And so I suffer from middle child syndrome, only, child, only sister, only daughter syndrome, and probably a few other ones as well. Um, but one thing my brothers taught me early on was the importance of speaking up for yourself, of using your voice to express yourself. Because if you're not speaking up for yourself, then others are speaking for you. And you're not always going to like what they have to say. So, education was emphasized in our family growing up. Um, we never took a family vacation, but we often took trips to the local library. And I loved to read. We used to have bumper stickers in our home that read, Literacy Begins at Home. And one of my favorite books that had a really transformative impact on me was the autobiography of Malcolm X. I read this when I was in high school. And it's really one of those books that kind of reaches inside of you. It grabs hold of everything that you think you know. And it shakes it and completely transforms your perception. And it revolutionized my perspective on race and politics. I went on to pharmacy school. 9-11 happened when I was in first year of pharmacy school. And those terrible tragic terror attacks um, helped shape the lives uh, moving forward for all Americans, but especially American Muslims. Um, I remember thinking to myself, as a Muslim in America, that life would never be the same again, um, as a Muslim woman especially, and it has not been. We saw a spike in hate crimes and bias attacks targeting American Muslim communities. There was a blanket of suspicion um, cast over American Muslim mosques and um, different houses of worship, and um, it really led to a spike in um, uh, anti-Muslim bias. In 2011, the Center for American Progress published a report, um, Fear Incorporated, and this was really a groundbreaking report because it highlighted that there was actually an Islamophobia industry within the United States that profited off of manufacturing fear and hatred against Islam and Muslims. And when I read this report, it opened my eyes to the need as an American Muslim to speak out and be more visible and to push back against a lot of the misinformation that existed out there. Because just like how myself and many other, many of you woke up every day, we would go to work, earn a salary to pay our bills. There were people who were waking up every day and their job was to spread hatred and fear of Muslims. In Hollywood, there was a dominant narrative that was being promoted that Islam is inherently violent, that Muslims are evil, and that it's okay to, um, to have aggressive, unconstitutional policies targeting our communities. There was an activist and author, his name was Dr. Jack Shaheen, and he published this book that really um, highlighted through thousands of films, over a thousand films that he was um, cataloging how the roles of Arabs and Muslims were being depicted. And it really um, set this stereotypical image of Arabs and Muslims being a certain, uh, a certain way in a negative fashion. A random quick 0.36 second Google search of Muslim woman would yield hundreds of thousands of results. A woman who looked nothing like myself, nothing like the many other amazing American Muslim women that I knew, um, but very frightening figures. People who, you know, if we didn't know much about Islam and Muslims, it would be very easy to be turned off by these images. And it was frightening to me that these were at the fingertips of the vast majority of American Muslims who didn't, didn't know much about Islam and about people like myself. One of the probably most disturbing aspects of the rise in Islamophobia was the impact that it had on Muslim youth. We saw a spike in faith-based bullying of Muslim children. We saw... Um, more and more children who were struggling to reconcile their American and Muslim aspects of their identity. I remember there was a campaign to destigmatize the word virgin when I was growing up. And it, we saw billboards all around the city that said, virgin, teach your kid it's not a dirty word. And I remember I would have conversations with Muslim youth and I would think to myself, 
that it would be wonderful to have some kind of campaign to help destigmatize the word Islam and Muslims. Because right now, it's just probably the most um, stigmatized racial and religious identity in the United States. Some of the most common stereotypes are that Muslims do, or hate the American way of life, or that Sharia is taking over our country, or that Islam oppresses women. And if we don't understand faith, it's easy to regurgitate what we hear in right-wing media or in biased media outlets. Um, and the reality couldn't be further from the truth. Um, actually, Islam is not new to America. It's been part of our country since before its founding. And if we understand the concept of Sharia, we would know that there is no place in the, in the world that we can practice Islam the way it's intended to than in the United States because of the Constitution. And that Islam requires that people abide by the laws of the land in which we reside. And so this all compelled me to take on this journey into activism. So I segued from pharmacy into nonprofit activism to help dispel a lot of the misinformation that was out there. I would see fear in the eyes of people who did not know much about our communities, and I would see our communities that were not equipped to be able to deal with some of the challenges that we were facing. So the goal was really to help educate and empower um, our, our, my, my Muslim communities to speak out against Islamophobia, but also to encourage youth to form their own narrative and to dismantle many of the misconceptions that existed about our communities. There's a powerful quote that Malcolm X has said, is credited for saying that the media is the most powerful entity on earth. Um, it's powerful because it has the power to make the innocent look guilty and to make the guilty look innocent. And that really has um, the ability to control the minds of the masses. It's a tool, it's a powerful tool to shape public perception. And it, millions around the world every day get their information about the world from news reports. And the way that these news reports are framed has a huge role to play in whether we have a positive or a negative response to it. And there's actually been studies that conducted that have been conducted that negative portrayals of Islam and Muslims are um, actually more prevalent in the media because they since they are sensationalized and they get higher ratings. So it comes down to dollars and cents. And for companies, for media conglomerates and organizations, that's what their goal is. At the end of the day, they want to make money, and sometimes it really. Um, it doesn't matter if it's accurate, if it gets the rating. And unfortunately, we saw a lot of that in the media. So I started doing a lot of media interviews. Um, it wasn't something I ever saw myself doing. I never imagined that I would ever be in a position where I would be like a spokesperson for my communities. But there was a need that was there, and that's what compelled me to come outside of my shell. And I remember one time I was about to go on to CNN. And I was sitting in the green room, and there was this really sweet lady who was in the room with me. And she comes up to me, and we're, we struck up a conversation. We had this great conversation going. Um, and just before I was about to go on, she comes up to me, and she like taps my arm. And she's like, oh, you speak perfect English. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I actually speak Baltimoreese. And for those of you who are native to Baltimore, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but there is this idea that People who are Muslim are foreign and cannot speak English or cannot be native to the cities um, in our country. I had the opportunity to sit in on President Obama's historic U.S. mosque visit in 2016. And this was really a, a groundbreaking moment for many American Muslims because especially in the face of so much Islamophobia, it sent a strong message that Muslims have a place in our country. And especially for the American Muslims who are indigenous to our country in the sense that their families have been here for centuries, um, this is really something that you know, many communities have struggled with over time. And I remember a couple days after the mosque visit, um, I got a phone call from a mother who had a fourth grade son in public school. And she was in tears. And she said to me that her son came home from school the day after the president President Obama visited a mosque, and she said that he told her that for the first time, he stood up for the Pledge of Allegiance in class. For the first time, her fourth grade son stood up for the Pledge of Allegiance because he felt, after seeing his president attend a, or visit a mosque, he felt American enough in his identity to be able to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. 
After the 2016 presidential election, we saw a spike in hate crimes and bias attacks targeting our communities. I received several calls from young women who were college students across Maryland, and they had either physically or um, been assaulted or they'd been verbally assaulted and had their headscarves or hijabs pulled off. And so a lot of people were asking me, should I take off my headscarf? And the idea that any woman would ever feel afraid because of the way that she is dressed was unacceptable. Whether she wears a headscarf or whether she doesn't, whether she wants to walk around wearing a bikini or whether she wants to walk around fully dressed, that's the woman's um, decision. But the idea that there were so many young girls and women who were afraid um, compelled us to begin offering self-defense workshops. And the idea was to empower young women, regardless of their religion, regardless of their identity, to feel confident in their identity, to be able to walk outside in public and not feel like they have to change who they are or the way that they dress because of how other people are acting. Um, so these actually became more popular than we'd imagined. Um, the, the response was pretty overwhelmingly positive. And um, one day I got a phone call from Vogue and they were interested in reporting on how American Muslim women were pushing back against Islamophobia. So they actually did this feature story on Muslim women in Maryland. It was pretty exciting. Um, I got to tell my mom, hey, I'm in Vogue. <laughs> I never imagined myself as a Muslim woman wearing a headscarf would ever be like in these kind of platforms. But the idea was really to highlight the, the, um, the, the wonderful young woman who had so much potential to really kind of um, push back against the fear, the fear mongering and the bigotry and to take ownership of their identity and not be afraid to highlight their voices and center their voices. Since the election, I had many women who have since then um, struggled with the idea of how they should reconcile their identities. And um, you know, my message is very simple and very clear. Um, in times of crisis, we have a choice. We have a choice of whether we're going to allow fear to divide us and change who we are, or we have a choice to push back against that fear, inform ourselves, and encourage others to be more informed and be more united than ever before. The Newton's first law of um, motion says that an object in motion will stay in motion until it meets with a resisting force. An object in motion will stay in motion until it meets with a resisting force. Your goals, your ambitions, your passion in life is that object. And every obstacle that you're going to encounter is that resisting force. And you have an opportunity to pledge to yourself to push back against those obstacles, to overcome them, and to make sure that you accomplish your goals regardless of the, the pushback that you're receiving. So my message is very simple. Be unstoppable. Thank you.